Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry for the delay today. Just wait for a few more minutes. We're going to start soon. There was a problem with the Facebook and the Zoom. We're going to start very soon. Okay, guys, so we're going to start our first aid AMC MCQ psychiatry review class just in a few minutes so that the others who are waiting in the Facebook live group, they can join us and then we can start the class. I'm really sorry for the initial delay because uh, previously when we used to use the Zoom webinar, there was no such problem like that. Nowadays, there has been, they have been changed a lot about how the Zoom will be interacting with others. So there was a little bit of problem with the option changes and everything. So I, I'm really sorry for the delay, but we're going to have a, a psychiatry review class very soon within just five minutes time so that the others who are waiting in the Facebook group, they can join us. In the meantime, let me introduce myself. I am Dr. Arshan Ahmed. I'm the owner and the CEO of First Aid AMC MCQ. We have been uh, preparing the IMGs for a, quite a lot of years, but the problem was that we have been offline, but no, never ever was an online before. Now, because of the COVID situations, I guess you guys know that there is a lot of isolation going on at the moment. So at, at this point of time, the, we have only the options of online. And I know that many of you's exams have been canceled and it's been a, like, it's not a good days going on at the moment, I guess. So that's why we are starting this online preparatory course. And for all of your information, this is this course is a Sydney-based registered AMC preparatory course. We take courses for MCQ, clinical, and also PISCI. I I guess more many of you don't know about PISCI or even clinical. So don't bother with that, but we also take uh, like a long five months course for MCQ. Today's class is mainly based on psychiatry, which is mainly very, very difficult for MCQ candidates because of why? Because most of you haven't been exposed to the psychiatry in your medical university. And there's the reason people who comes from the like Asian countries, or if you say like any countries, Europe, Asia, Africa, anywhere of you, you feel some difficulty with the psychiatry mainly. Others, you guys know, like medicine, surgery, these are not very difficult for you, but psychiatry is like a hell for many of you. But with us, we will make sure that your psychiatry becomes concrete first, because if psychiatry is concrete, then others will be very easier for you. So let's just see that if others have been joined in the Facebook group, we're just waiting for two more minutes and then we will start our class. Thank you for waiting for us. And yep, 
Just give me two minutes time. Thank you. Okay, guys, so let's start the class today. So as we have been saying that psychiatry is one of the very important for your MCQ exam. Now, before anything we start from, main thing you should know that what are the books you need to prepare for the MCQ. We will discuss about that in our classes so far. We will take some of the free classes in this month so that you guys can understand that how we take classes and how everything will be prepared for all of you. Now, today we will just concentrate on psychiatry. So for psychiatry, what are the books that you should follow that you should first know? First thing is your JM 7th edition. Although in the JM, you may not find everything which is required for psychiatry, but if you can mix JM with your Kaplan step two psychiatry, then both of them together will be a very really strong combination. So first thing is always John Murtagh seventh edition. The second one will be Kaplan step two CK. Now third one for your better understanding of your questions, you should always go through the U World USMLE, which is you can uh, you can find us find it from our group. I think we haven't been updated that, but we are trying to up upload that U World so that you guys can go through that. UWorld USMLE is a very important for making your concept crystal clear. Even though you know many things about psychiatry, if you don't go through the questions, you will never ever understand the questions. So main, main thing is first finish your theory and then also with that practice many questions on psychiatry. Together, 
you will understand how to answer questions correctly in exam. Sometimes what happens in exam that some people may not even get two or three psychiatric questions and some candidate may get like 20, 30 questions just only from psychiatry. So it depends on how you use your luck. So if your luck is good, you will get less psychiatric questions. But again, if you are good at psychiatry, then it, if you get a lot of psychiatry questions, then most likely you will pass the exam because psychiatry, the AMC usually thinks that it's a difficult situation or difficult question for the candidate. And if you can pass or if you can make correct a lot of psychiatry questions, then your exam will be more easy to pass. So let's start the psychiatry. Today we are going to discuss mainly the theory and then in the next few sessions we will discuss some of the practice questions which is which can come in the exam sometimes. So we will start with the depression. We will go through the bipolar disorder. We will go through schizophrenia and some other related disorders with that. I guess that all of you will enjoy the class. If any one of you having any difficulty about these topics, this is the time you can ask me. I, I will be happy to answer any of your queries. Those who are in the Facebook Live, you may not be able to interact with me. So what you can do, you can write it in the comment section. If any problem, then I will just have a look in the comment section and I will answer your queries. So. Let's start psychiatry depression. Always we start with depression because we don't we want to first finish depression and then we don't want to be depressed about psychiatry anymore. Right? So depression. What is depression? Now in psychiatry, we think we always want to know like is it a major depressive disorder or not? If you look at this question, you can see a 70 year old woman was recently admitted after her son informed the doctor that she had been doing very poorly over the past few months. The patient reports a 30 pound weight loss, decreased concentration, feeling of hopelessness and helplessness, decreased energy, depressed mood and decreased sleep. You may not understand that why all these things are given. These are given due to a particular reason. If you want to make a diagnosis of major depressive disorder, this is the criteria you need to follow. This is called DSM-5 diagnostic criteria. According to the criteria, at least five of the following symptoms should be there for at least two weeks time. Now, you can see there is nine symptoms. Among nine symptoms, you have to have at least five symptoms for at least two weeks time. Now, most important two symptoms is the number one and number two. From number one and number two, at least one symptom should be there to diagnose it as a case of MDD or major depressive disorder. Now, you don't need to memorize these things. There is a very good mnemonic for that, which we know as m caps. What is M size caps? M for mood changes. So it can, it can be low mood or irritable mood. S for sleep changes, especially people with depression, they have insomnia and some atypical depression patient, they can have hypersomnia also. Then I for interest or loss of interest. Loss of interest we call anhedonia. So this term you should know. Then G for guilty feeling or feeling of worthlessness, feeling of hopeless. These are all under G. E for energy. So there will be lack of energy. C for concentration. So lack of concentration. A for appetite changes. So if you have appetite change, you can have loss of weight or you can even have gain of weight. P for psychomotor changes. You can have psychomotor agitation, you can have psychomotor retardation. What are those? Psychomotor retardation means patient will say that doctor, everything is slowed down. So patient will be slowed down on everything. Or agitation means they will have they will be very easily agitated and irritated. 
And lastly, S for suicidal ideation. Among all these nine symptoms, what do you think? Which one is the most important symptoms that you should always ask in a depressive patient? Yep, Dr. Shaila, very good. Dr. Faril Jaffrey, Dr. Afia, very good. That's, that means that we should always, always ask about suicidal ideation in a depressive patient. That's the most important question. All right, now you can see that among these nine symptoms, we need at least five for at least two weeks time to diagnose it as a case of mesodepressive disorder. All right, now you can see in here, these are the same things written in here. If you come to the question now, then you will understand the question at the moment. So you see that this is a 70 year old woman has been doing poorly over the past few months. So you understand that these symptoms is going on more than two weeks, right? So that's first criteria. The next one is loss of weight concentration, guilty feeling, energy, depressed mood, decreased sleep. So what, how many symptoms have you got? One, two, three, four, five, six. So you have got six, you have got depressed mood, which is important because if you remember, first two, depressed mood or irritability, loss of interest or pleasure, among these two, at least one should be obviously there. And together with that, at least five symptoms. You have already got six symptoms over six months. Sorry, over a few months. So that make your diagnosis as major depressive disorder. This is from your GM. As you can see, it's a page 179. Two key criteria for MDD is depressed mood and marked loss of interest, which we call anhedonia for at least two weeks time. And other criteria we have already discussed. Some of the important discussion on JM about depression we are going to discuss. It's not only major depressive disorder in depression criteria, there are other depression also. What are those? One we call as disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, persistent depressive disorder, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, all of them included in depression criteria. What is persistent depressive disorder? If you have a long standing depression of mild severity for more than equal two years time, then we call it persistent depressive disorder. You need to remember this because any time in the exam, they can make a question like that. The patient has a mild symptoms of depression for three years time. And they are asking you that what is your diagnosis? So your diagnosis will be persistent depressive disorder at that time. Now, another one important thing is that depression can be three types, mild, moderate, severe. We will discuss that in a few minutes time. But before we discuss the type and treatment of depression, you should know that there is a term called atypical symptoms in a person with depression. What are those three things? One, weight gain, increased appetite, and increased sleep. So three things, hypersomnia, which is increased sleep, appetite increased, followed by gaining of weight. So these three things are the atypical features of depression. If any time if they ask that, what is the worst prognosis for a depression patient? If depression patient has an association with psychosis, that's the worst prognosis. What is, what is like that? Like a patient is having depression, like having low mood, loss of interest, difficulty sleeping, loss of weight with that, patient also thinks that someone is trying to kill him. 
So what is this part that some, that if a person thinks that he that someone is trying to kill him, that is called delusion. So patient is having some abnormal belief. So with depression, patient has some delusion. That is called depression with psychotic feature. If anyone has this depression and psychosis all together, that's the worst prognosis. Now tell me if this is the case, if a person with depression and psychosis comes to you, what you will treat first, depression or psychosis? The thing is like, first of all, we will start with the SSRI medication, followed by if SSRI is ineffective, then you will add antipsychotic drugs. So first we start with SSRI, which is the treatment for depression. If SSRI ineffective, then you will start the patient with antipsychotic drugs. We will have that question in, in this discussion and you will understand more about that. All right, now, as we have been discussing about the treatment, so you know, like there are two types of treatment for depression. One is pharmacological, another is psychological. Psychological therapy is more important for mild or moderate depression cases. In severe depression, we usually go for pharmacological treatment. Pharmacological treatment, main treatment is antidepressant medication, which is SSRI, serotonin reactive inhibitor. So that SSRI is the main treatment. There are others like tricyclic antidepressant, MAO inhibitors, and even last option would be electroconvulsive therapy or ECT. Now, sometimes depression can come in children and adolescent. What is the dif main difference between depression in elderly and depression in children? The main difference is that children usually doesn't come to you with a low mood. Rather, they come to you with an irritable mood, restlessness, that's more prominent. So you can see in here, in children, irritability may be more prominent than sadness. Others are pretty similar, like difficulty sleeping, enjoying the things that they used to enjoy before, which is lack of interest, poor in concentration, helplessness, worthlessness. These are all common, but the mood usually in children, they are more irritable than becoming a sad person. So remember, if in children it comes in the exam, they will give you that uh, the 15 year old girl getting more irritable these days with lack of sleep, having some weight changes. So what you should think about? You should think about depression in adolescence. Now, the, your next question, what is the most effective antidepressant for adolescent patient? All right, now remember, for adolescent, usually CBT doesn't work because they don't like cognitive behavioral therapy. For them, medication is usually important. What medication? Yes, Dr. Fadil, very good. So it could be fluvoxamine or fluxetin. These medications are very, very good for adolescent depression. This is in your handbook. So make sure you also read the handbook psychiatry.
there is a term called recurrent brief depression. What is that? That's an important thing. The recurrent brief depression is like if a patient presents to you with a recurrent episode of depression of short duration, like about three to seven days, and it's coming as like every month. So the scenario will be like that. A 20 year old female comes to you with recurrent episodes of depression for the last six months. And she's coming to you in every month with low mood, lack of interest, lack of energy, loss of concentration, poor school performance. So all of these things coming just for, and it's not for two weeks. It's just lasting for about three to seven days, but it's coming every month or like frequent short duration episodes of depression like symptoms that is called recurrent brief depression. In this particular depression, antidepressants are not effective. Usually management will be psychotherapy, which is CBT and alternative to CBT or as a long-term medication, if you want to give, that would be lithium. This is a very important because this is the only depression where we use lithium. No other depressive patient we use lithium. So management is based on psychotherapy, especially CBT, and lithium is an alternative medication for long-term use. Another depression is seasonal affective disorder. Seasonal affective disorder is just a depression-like features in relation to change of season like mostly in winter season people get depressed some of the people not every people so if depression features only presents during cold climate or winter season this we call seasonal affective disorder treatment again psychotherapy which is cbt phototherapy or lastly medication so usually phototherapy may come in the exam because this is an like exceptional kind of treatment or depression now comes to the management for mild moderate and severe depression how we can treat this patient and how to understand that this patient is having mild depression, moderate depression, or severe depression. Remember, mild depression means that patient life is not affected too much. There is depression-like feature, but obviously in mild depression, there will be no suicidal thoughts. If there is suicidal thoughts, always think it as a severe depression. So usually we can define the mild and mild moderate and severe based on your suicidal thoughts and how it is affecting a person's life. Normally mild moderate will not affect too much and they, they will not have the sort of suicidal thoughts. They will have insight also, but severe depression patient will not have insight. They may have some psychotic features also and most importantly, they will have some suicidal thoughts. For mild to moderate depression, we can start with psychological therapy, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. What is CBT, by the way? CBT is usually given by psychologist. So you will be like one-to-one -one psychologist and the patient in a room, and psychologist will try to understand what's going on in a patient's mind. And they will show the positive way of how the patient can get rid of the negative thoughts. So depression patient will have some negative thoughts or poor self-esteem about themselves. And psychologists will try to make these negative thoughts into positive thoughts. That is usually the basic of CBT. In case of severe depression, you should start with antidepressant medication first. And sometimes even severe depression comes at a point you may need to consider ECT or electroconvulsive therapy. Now, tell me at least one or two criteria when we would think about ECT, electroconvulsive therapy.
Yep, Dr. Fahil, good. So if all treatment failed, yep, Dr. Afia, so depression with psychotic feature, you can start with medication first. If that doesn't help, then we can go for ECT. There is a specific term. If a depression patient becomes totally muted, like a catatonic kind of features, that's a very important indication for ECT. So a depressed patient becomes so much depressed that he becomes catatonic. Catatonic means that you will, you will be like looking at the ceiling for like 24 hours. You will not even blink. So it's a kind of a statue situation. That's one of the important indications. If all other treatment fail, pregnant patient, you can use that and depression with psychotic features. Important another one is like a patient who doesn't, who is like, who has severe depression and wants to harm themselves. Like there is a question sometimes can come in the exam. A patient with depression thinks that she doesn't need to eat anything. So she has stopped eating and drinking for the last 24 hours. And the question is stopped there. And you want to do a ECT of this patient. Patient doesn't have any insight to give consent for the ECT. What you can do? So first thing is, will you take two psychiatrist recommendation? That's your one option. Your second option will be go for the ECT un under duty of care. Or number three is wait for the tribunal. So, so you are going to go for the tribunal. You are going to give ECT under duty of care or you will take two psychiatric recommendation. Remember, there is two questions that can come in this way. What is that? ECT under duty of care is only appropriate if you think that patient is going to die at the moment. Like if you don't give IV fluid now, patient will go into shock. And in that time, the question will add a thing that patient is severely dehydrated. So patient is stop taking food, stop taking, stop drinking anything. And then there is an addition in the question that patient is severely dehydrated. At that time, you should always choose ECT under duty of care. If that is not there, that how is the patient? Like patient is stopped drinking, patient is not taking any food for the last 24 hours. And in that question, it's not mentioned that how is the patient? Is vital is stable or unstable, dehydrated or not? Nothing is mentioned. At that time, wait for the tribunal. Okay. Now a patient with severe depression who needs ECT, can they give consent? Most of the time, no. Usually severe depression who is at this stage that he needs ECT, most of the time they will not be able to give any consent because they are lack of insight of what treatment is needed. So even though at this time patient say that yes, he, she doesn't want ECT and she doesn't give consent to the ECT, you can act on tribunal measurement. Okay, so that's an important thing for ECT we should remember. Another one important thing I wanted you to know, if any patients goes for ECT, what is the most important blood test that you should do?
renal profile that's a broad thing i want to lead just to exact one one answer especially potassium level guys so electrolyte creatinine is good but most importantly we should always check the potassium level because any patient who has hypokalemia if they go for ect they can develop very bad arrhythmia even ventricular fibrillation so you should always check serum potassium level before anyone goes for ect that's an important question ECT causes reversible or irreversible memory loss. Which one? Reversible. Yeah, good. All right, so these are all related to exam questions. Sometimes many these questions can come in the exam because these are important things. And you should remember and you should know these things very, very well noted way. So that you should have a note that in the ECT, I should know these things. And then you should stick these things into your JM. That's an effective way of reading or making sure that you don't need to go through all the books that you are reading for six or seven months, just before one month of your exam. So make sure, make a little sticky notes and keep it in your JM so that at the last month of your exam, you can just open your JM and you will get everything in a one book. So we have been discussing a lot about ECT, but these are important topics. Now, come to the serotonin syndrome, which is important because it's related to SSRI. Now, your serotonin syndrome is a serious adverse reaction. It can happen to people who, who uses SSRI. So as the name implies, if in your body, serotonin level increases due to any reasons, then you can develop this serious condition called serotonin syndrome. It can happen if you take two SSRI altogether. It can happen if you are taking SSRI like sartraline, fluxetine, and just suddenly you have increased the dose. So increased dose of one SSRI or you are taking more than one SSRI containing drugs or serotonin containing drugs that can lead to serotonin syndrome. It's not only the antidepressant that increases serotonin level in your body. If you look at here, drugs to be considered is antidepressant like SSRI, PCA, it could be your MAO inhibitors, okay? It could be SNRI, Another one is very important, which is this opioid, tramadol. Very important for the exam because tramadol and SSRI together can cause a severe serotonin syndrome. Some of the stimulant drug, like if you take ice or Stacy, that can cause serotonin syndrome. Antiemetic lithium, lithium is also important. What is the symptom of serotonin syndrome? First, it will affect the CNS, so it, you can have some agitation, confusion, and also you can develop seizure or even coma. Then it will involve the muscle, so you can have tremor, shivering, hyperreflexia. Remember, hyperreflexia, tremor is a very important feature of serotonin syndrome. It can cause hypertension or hypotension. It can cause tachycardia. Even you can have a like more than 40 degrees Celsius temperature, which is fever, high fever, you can have diarrhea also. So important is if you look at here, this is called serotonin syndrome. Look at the eyes, you will have dilated pupil, mygiasis. You will have diaphoresis, that means increased sweating. You will be agitated, restless, irritable. You will have tachycardia, hypertension or hypotension. You will have high fever also. You will have increased peristalsis. So your autonomic activity will be increased. So autonomic activity if increased, what happens? Just think that there is a 
there is a dog or there is a bear who is after you trying to kill you what will happen in your body you will try to run away right and your body autonomic system will be activated and when you are surprised or when you are like when your autonomic system is activated what will happen your eyes usually gets bigger so you will your pupil will be dilated you will be sweating you will, you will get tachycardia your pulse will be increased your blood pressure will rise and even sometimes you can have diarrhea and it can affect the cns so you can have hyperreflexia hypertonia and also clonus these are the important features of serotonin syndrome now serotonin syndrome as the main cause is increased serotonin in the blood and it's due to some offending agents so you have to stop any medications patient is taking which contains serotonin so you stop all drugs which contain serotonin that's your first treatment and then because patient is having high fever you can provide some cool blanket if the patient is having hyper rigidity then you can give some diazepam to make the patient calm down and lastly sometimes patient gets severe serotonin syndrome at that time you can use an antidote called ciproheptadine what is the name ciproheptadine but the main treatment is to stop the ssri containing drug or serotonin containing drug now tell me one question answer you stopped serotonin drugs like this situation will come in this way a 36 year old woman has been taking serotonin uh, has been taking sertraline for the past two years now recently her gp has started fluxetine and the patient is taking both sertraline and fluxetine for the last one week time and the now patient comes to you with high fever agitation sweating tremor what's your diagnosis serotonin syndrome what's your management stop sertraline and fluxetine now patient becomes stable in the hospital and psychiatrist wants to start medication like the because patient will be depressed also so psychiatrist wants to start antidepressant medication so can he start both medication again no so he can start one medication right so either one of them will be started either fluxetin or serotonin or sertraline not the both one if any time you are changing the antidepressant medication you need you need to keep a washout period between the two medication what is washout period if you are taking fluxetin and even if you stop taking the medication today your blood will have the effect of fluxetin for the next 7 days so even if you stop fluxetin and if you start taking another ssri within the next 7 days you can develop serotonin syndrome that's the reason you should give a break between starting of the two medication so you want to stop fluxetin and you want to start sertraline in a patient so what will be your action you stop fluxetin and you cannot stop fluxetin all together you have to stop gradually so you will gradually stop the fluxetin then give a 7 day break and then you start with a low dose sertraline then you will increase the sertraline dose so this seven day washout period is very important for starting or changing antidepressant medication. Clear? Another question, if a patient is taking sartraline and patient starts to have abdominal pain, and anorexia due to taking the sartraline what is your next option to choose handbook question
So you have you are taking sartreline for like four weeks, and the patient developed anorexia, loss of appetite, and having diarrhea or abdominal pain. So a patient taking sartreline it starts having abdominal pain, lack of appetite. What's your next option? So you want to change sartreline to another drug like another SNRI or you want to switch sartreline to another SSRI. So the main thing is like this, if a patient is taking sartreline or any SSRI and they develop abdominal pain, lack of appetite, then your next option or best option to choose is switch to another SSRI. So you can switch to fluxetin or any other SSRI. For abdominal pain or GIT related upset due to SSRI, we follow this pathway. That means switch to another SSRI. What if the same patient starts taking sartreline and develops sexual dysfunction or erectile dysfunction? At that time, you cannot switch to another SSRI because all SSRI has more or less similar type of sexual dysfunction complication. So at that time, you should not switch to another SSRI. You will switch, you will switch to another antidepressant which has low sexual dysfunction. What are those? You can, the options that you can follow is you can decrease the dose of say, SSRI medication, that's one option. Another option, you can change to another antidepressant, not SSRI. So you can change to SNRI like bupropion, nifajodone, trazodone, metajapine. So you can switch to another antidepressant, but not SSRI. So any patient with the SSRI having sexual dysfunction, what is your next option to choose? You have to choose either one of them. One, you can decrease the dose of SSRI or you can switch to another antidepressant, not another SSRI. You can switch to SNRI. Clear everyone? Whatever I am discussing today, I know that it's taking a little bit of time from you guys, but these are very, very important questions. And I guess those of you who are preparing for the exam, you guys understand that how much important these questions are. The next one is your there is a condition called neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome is complication of antipsychotic medication. So those who are taking antipsychotic medication, they can develop a condition called neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which is characterized by high fever, diffuse rigidity of the muscle, And they can also develop kind of like tremor sometimes, hypertonia sometimes they can develop, sorry, hypotonia sometimes they can develop and hyporeflexia. So if you want to differentiate between serotonin syndrome and neuroleptic malignant syndrome, first thing to think that serotonin syndrome will happen due to SSRI containing medication or serotonin containing medication. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome will happen because of antipsychotic medication. Other important difference is serotonin syndrome main neurological finding is hypertonia and hyperreflexia and also some tremor. Whereas in neuroleptic malignant syndrome, your main neurological finding is diffuse rigidity of the muscle. And also, if you look at the here, reflex increases on serotonin syndrome and it decreased on neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Also, pupil will be dilated in, in serotonin syndrome and pupil will be normal in neuroleptic malignant syndrome.
okay and also yes dr file good that means ck so creatinine kinase mostly increases in neuroleptic malignant syndrome but the thing is serotonin syndrome can also increase ck so it's not quite differentiating between these two but nms which is neuroleptic malignant syndrome increases ck more than the serotonin syndrome Now the next one is if a patient is taking antidepressant medication, how long this patient will continue to take it? If antidepressant medication is used and remission is achieved, it is recommended that it should be continued for a minimum of 12 months for an initial episode. So if you have the first attack of depression, then 12 months you should take. And if a patient has subsequent episode like recurrent episodes of depression then for two to three years they should take let's just do some of the depression related question that will usually clear your idea about depression a 46 year old man comes to the office with a two month history of depressed mood low energy and problems concentrating at work patient has been overeating gained 4.5 kilo and is disgusted with himself for not exercising so you can see there is weight gain he sleeps 14 hours a day and has difficulty getting out of bed so also sleeping is increased so this is a kind of atypical features of depression you are getting here he becomes tearful when describing how he loves his children, but no longer feels happy to see them. What, what does it mean? Lack of interest, right? Tearful means low mood. You have already got two. You have got energy, concentration, eating, sleeping. So already you have got all the depression features. No suicidal ideation. At that time, he did not seek treatment or right. Others are all normal. He is diagnosed with mesodepressive disorder and is started on sartralin. After eight weeks, there is no improvement and patient is switched to a cytolopram. On a follow-up visit, two months later, he says that his depression are still there. And the decision was made to discontinue his cytolopram and start a new medication. Which of the following medication will be most appropriate for this patient? So see that psychiatric question in the exam will be just like this. A lot of information, long question, and then you have to understand what you want to choose. And there will be clues in the question which you need to pick it up. So what do you think you should do here? So patient started on sartralin, switched to a cytolopram. Both of them is ineffective. So two SSRI ineffective. Can we go for another SSRI? No. If any patient failed to SSRI, most likely giving another SSRI will not help. So obviously don't choose fluxetine. And then you can rule out other things. So quetiapine is usually antipsychotic drug, so it will not be an option for depression. So this is also out. Trazodone, metajapine, bupropion, amitriptyline. Amitriptyline is a TCA or tricyclic antidepressant. Usually we don't use as a drug of choice for depression. So this is out. Then comes to bupropion, metajapine, trazodone. What do you want to do? Now let's check about meter Japin. Problem with meter Japin is that meter Japin is very much over sedative. That will help this patient, but meter Japin can cause increased weight. This patient is already gained 4.5 kilo weight. So will you give another medication which will increase weight? No. So metajapine is out. 
Bupropion, on the other hand, doesn't increase body weight. Okay, and it doesn't usually interact the sleep. And it's a kind of SNRI. So if any patient, after giving two antidepressants, like two SSRI, that's not effective. You should not switch to another SSRI. You should think about another SNRI. Among the SNRI, you can choose either bupropion, metazapine. Trazodone is also a kind of antidepressant, but these are very much sedative, and usually we don't use trazodone initially. Among metazapine, we could choose metazapine in this case if there was no gaining of body weight. So as there is gaining of body weight, and bupropion usually doesn't increase body weight, this is our most appropriate option to choose. So this is how we need to know. So some of the important adverse effects of some this medication we need to know. Remember, metazapin is over sedative. Anyone having hypersomnia, we can give metazapin to seduce or yeah, we can give them to sedate this patient. But metazapin, on the other hand, they also increase body weight. So that's why we cannot use this one in here. Bupropion doesn't interact with sleep and it doesn't increase body weight. That's why it's a better option in here. So these are all the antidepressant you can see we can use. Now bupropion is a not SNRI, it's a kind of like called NDRI, norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitor. So that's also you can use. Venlafaxine is SNRI. Can you use venlafaxine in this patient if that was an option? If I say no, what is the reason for that? Because venlafaxine is particularly notorious for causing hypersomnia and hypertension. So this patient is sleeping 14 hours a day already and you give venlafaxine, patient will be sleeping 24 hours, <laughs> right? So you cannot give venlafaxine in a patient who sleeps a lot. So some of these adverse effects which are very common, we need to know. So even venlafaxine was there, we could not choose that one, clear? Next question, 50 year old woman is taken to the hospital after neighbors find her wandering the streets, mumbling to herself and gesturing. When approached, she begins to cry and expresses thoughts about hurting herself. There is some scratch mark on the forearm. When questioned, she reports feeling depressed since her husband died five months ago. She reports a decrease in concentration feeling of helplessness, hopelessness, and hedonia, which resulted in her quitting the job and staying at home. She now has begun to hear her husband's voice asking her to join him. Which of the following would be the next step in management? Begin a trial of antidepressant medication, refer to psychiatry, refer for ECT, Assess for thoughts about suicide and refer to the outpatient department for follow up. What do you think should be done first? What about those who are in the Facebook Live? You guys are not answering questions. Yeah, you guys are right. So very important thing is like, because this patient is having suicidal ideation, having a scratch mark on the arms, you should obviously first assess for thoughts about suicide. That's the most important thing to do in here. 
Now, if this patient wants to go home, can you keep the patient in hospital? Or will you let the patient go to the home at this time? What do you think? No. Why? Because this patient is having a risk of self-harm and obviously she is lacking of insight. This patient, even if she wants to go home, you have a right to admit her involuntarily. So remember, any patient having active hallucination, active delusion, active suicidal or homicidal ideation, you have to admit the patient in the hospital, keep her in the hospital even if they want to go. This is called involuntary admission. So that was all about depression. I don't think there is any questions left with depression. If you understand what I was saying, so it will help a lot for all of you. And whenever you will practice some questions, you will find out that how important it was. Let's move to the bipolar disorder, which is an interesting one. Remember, if, if you look at this picture, this is the normal mood of a normal person. Some people has high mood, some people has low mood. Low mood is the depressive phase and high mood is the manic phase. And bipolar disorder includes both of them. So if a patient has both episodes of depression as well as episodes of mania or hypomania, we call this bipolar disorder. Now mania can be like total mania or sometimes can be a mild form, which is hypomania. Just same like mild, moderate, severe depression. What is the criteria for mania? You should know. Obviously, the symptom should be at least one week and the main symptoms will be elevated, elevated mood or euphoric state. So patient will have elevated mood with three or more of the following features. What are those? Inflated self-esteem or grandiosity. So they will, they will say that I am the messenger of God. God has given me the power to heal everyone. So that is called grandiosity. They will have decreased need for sleep. They will be very much talkative, loud. There will be flight of ideas, which means that they are thinking that they are thinking one topic and they are just jumping to another topic. So that is called flight of ideas, which means that Flight of ideas is, is a kind of like the patient is saying, um, moon, moon is from the bus, bus is from the car, car is going to the pool, pool is very much fun. So if you look at the topic, how they are doing, they are jumping from one topic to another. Moon is from bus, bus is going to car, car is going to pool. Pool is very much fine. So there is no meaning of whatever they are saying, but there is a little association between each of the sentence. That is flight of ideas. Similar thing is called loosening of association, which has no association. Like in flight of ideas, you can see a little like moon, bus, bus, car, car, pool, pool, fine. So every sentence has a little association, but they are jumping from one topic to another. But in, if in schizophrenia, there will be a term called loosening of association, which is no association between the sentence the patient is saying. Like patient, will, you will ask, what's your father's name? They will say, my father is a service holder, service is not good. Sorry, no, they will be not like that. My father is a service holder. My grandfather was a farmer. My mother worked at farming house. 
I'm going to look, I'm going to watch the movie today. What you are doing. So in each of the sentence, whatever the patient is saying, no association between each of the sentence, that is called loosening of association, which is a finding for schizophrenia. Clear? So that's important to know. Because you have a sentence like that and they will ask you that, what do you mean by that? So you need to understand very important. So what each of these things means, flight of ideas. In mania, there is a term called pressured speech. What is pressured speech? Many a patient will talk very loudly and they will talk a lot and lot. That is called pressured speech. So another one patient will be destructible. Patient will be more goal directed. So they will start doing a lot of activities altogether, but nothing they will be very much success, successful. And it will have a marked impairment on their social, familial and occupational life. That is mania. For mania, there is a very good mnemonic called DIG first. D for destructible, so patient will be poorly focused and multitasking, so they will do a lot of tasks. Insomnia, so decreased need for sleep. G for grandiosity, F for flight of ideas or racing of their thoughts. A for activity, so increased goal-directed activities. S for speech, which is pressured or more talkative. And thoughtlessness, which is that means patient will take a lot of risk taking behavior, right? Like reckless driving, expending a lot with shopping, having excessive sexual desire. So these sort of things are a features of mania. So dig first, if it is there, then we think about mania. Now look at this bipolar disorder. A 19 year old college student is taken to the school counselor after he failed several classes. The patient is enrolled in numerous classes, most of which have conflicting times. So patient enrolled in numerous classes. So what is that? Multitask and goal directed task. His grades are poor, yet he seems undisturbed by this lack of insight. He is also enrolled in numerous organizations such as chess club, drama club, sports, to at least two fraternities. His speech is pressured and has psychomotor agitation. Psychomotor agitation means they will be restless and talkative. So that is mania. To diagnose mania, these symptoms should be there for at least one week and it should impair the patient's life. What if the symptoms is less than a week and it does not affect the patient's life? That is called hypomania. All right, so usually you need to find out mania and hypomania. Usually sometimes it comes in the option. So you need to understand what is mania and what is hypomania. There is two term, one is called bipolar one and bipolar two disorder. What is bipolar one disorder? Bipolar one means if a patient has one fully fleshed manic episode and usually depressive episode, then it's called bipolar disorder. Bipolar 2 disorder is usually major depression with hypomanic episode, but not classic manic episode. So what is the difference between bipolar 1 and bipolar 2? Bipolar 1 should have one fully fleshed manic episode. With that, some depression. But bipolar 2 usually will not have any manic episode. They will have major depression with hypomania. So this is the only difference between bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. What is the management of acute mania? First thing, you have to hospitalize this patient even if it is involuntary. And what is the most effective treatment for mania? Antipsychotic drug. So first line treatment will be either olanzapine or risperidone. 
Second line, you can give haloperidol, lithium carbonate, or even some mood stabilizer, sodium valproate or carbamazepine. So olanzapine, risperidone, that's antipsychotic first line treatment. Second line will be haloperidol, lithium, sodium valproate or carbamazepine. So initial, like if a patient comes to you with an acute manic episode, you will start with antipsychotic drug. But some patient will need profile axis for recurrent bipolar disorder. What is the recommended prophylactic agent? Lithium. So usually if they ask that maintenance drug for bipolar disorder or manic disorder, what is your treatment? It will be lithium. Other one you can use some like second generation antipsychotic or you can use carbamazepine, sodium valproate also. But usually we use lithium as a maintenance drug for bipolar disorder. In any patient who is taking lithium, you should always check lithium level every three to six monthly. What is the normal level of lithium? 0 0.6 to 0 0.8. Why lithium is important? Because lithium can cause some significant side effect. What are those? It can initially comes to you with a nausea, vomiting, tremor, and later on, it can present with hyperreflexia, hypertonia, hypotension, even cardiovascular collapse. So lithium is important. Lithium, sometimes it causes nephrotoxicity, so renal failure, Lithium causes hypothyroidism. So any patient on lithium, you need to check thyroid function test. Lithium causes weight gain, tremor, GIT upset, and muscle weakness. Particularly important question that can come is if a patient with lithium, just divide the lithium side effect or toxicity treatment into two parts. One, if lithium level in the blood is less than four and there is no cardiovascular or CNS involvement, then your main treatment will be, what will be your main treatment? Less than four. If less than four, no involvement of Cardio, that means no cardiovascular collapse, no CNS involvement. At that time, you can just stop lithium and give IV normal cell line, just rehydrate the patient. If lithium level more than four, or there is cardiovascular collapse, that means patient is in a shock, or there is severe CNS manifestation like seizure, coma, confusion, altered mental status, you need to go for dialysis. So more than four, dialysis, or if symptom is very severe, like CNS, severe CNS manifestation or CVS manifestation, we go for dialysis. Clear everyone? Uh, who asked the question, uh, Dr. Faril? No, hypomania doesn't need hospitalization. You can treat similarly, like giving antipsychotic, but they don't need hospitalization. Remember one thing. If you give, if a patient has underlying bipolar disorder and you give only antidepressant to that patient, that patient can turn out to be a case of bipolar disorder in few months to few years. That's why usually if you think that this patient is having bipolar disorder, you have to give both antidepressant and mood stabilizer at the same time, followed by withdrawal of the antidepressant within one or two months. Because antidepressant can precipitate mania. So what I have said, remember any patient comes to you with a bipolar depression or bipolar disorder at the moment, we start both antidepressant 
with lithium valproate quetiapine olanzapine so any of this antipsychotic drug you can use the thing is like let me give you a scenario a patient comes to you with history of low mood lack of sleeping loss of weight for the for the next for the last 3 weeks time this patient had a history of elevated mood restlessness lack of uh, lack of need for sleeping in the last year what should be your treatment now this patient at the moment having depression but one year ago this patient had mania so you know that this patient diagnosis is bipolar disorder for this patient you will not only give antidepressant you will also add antipsychotic medication with an antidepressant if you don't do that this can precipitate mania clear another term if you remember we discussed about this one initially persistent depressive disorder if a patient has persistent mild symptoms of depression for more than two years that's called pdd or dysthymia usually for those sort of patient we need to give psychotherapy first and then you can give some medication so persistent depression depressive disorder or pdd or dysthymia is prolonged symptoms of depression of mild severity for more than equal two years next option is your psycho cyclothymic disorder what is cyclothymic disorder if a patient has many periods of depression with many periods of hypomania for at least two years that means it's a kind of mild bipolar disorder for more than two years if you look at here mrs mcdonald has experienced 12 year history of period of feeling great followed by period of feeling lousy that means mania this is hypomania with depression during her feeling great she experienced increased sexual drive euphoria increased irritability so you understand this is hypomania during her feeling lousy she experienced insomnia fatigue low self-esteem so for the 12 years she's having this mania hypomania with depression that is called cyclothymic disorder more than two years many periods of depression with hypomania that is your cyclothymic disorder usually in this case what will be your treatment you should give either lithium carbamazepine or valproic acid that means maintenance drug in here not antipsychotic all right guys just give me one minute i'm just coming in one minute time and then um we will give you some break before because we will discuss schizophrenia today also just give me one minute coming
Okay, guys. So we have been discussing about the bipolar disorder, cyclothymic disorder, and this thing. Now there is a term called bereavement or grief and depression. How to differentiate between grief and depression? Remember, grief or bereavement usually occurs in relation to someone, someone's death or loss of something which you are really cared about. So that's grief or bereavement can be there up to six months. Up to six months, like the, a patient after following his mother's death, he's having this low mood, crying all the time, lack of sleeping, and also seeing his mom uh, in the dream or even sometimes in the reality. So, but it's for two months, that's grief. But if, the, if that is like more than six months, the term we, that we use is called complicated bereavement. And usually, if there is symptoms like, if there is symptoms, full blown symptoms of depression, like MSH caps, if it's there and it's more than six months, then we can tell it as a depression. So, three things one is grief, normal grief, which usually can happen up to six months of following death. After six months, even after six months, if, if a patient is having this low mood, crying and everything, that's complicated bereavement. If after six months, full-blown symptoms of depression persist, like you have all the MSH cap criteria, then we can also diagnose it as a depression. Let's see this question. What do you think about this one? A 27 year old man is brought to the ED by his wife due to her concern that he is not himself. The patient has been very irritable, hyperactive, sleeping only one or two hours a night. The patient has been very distracted, unproductive at work to the point that his employer has placed him on probation. So it's affecting his life. When asked about his job at a factory, he says he approached his boss about using a special robot prosthetic to make the production line faster than ever and double everyone's productivity. Patient add, I don't know what my wife is worried about. I've never had so much energy, so increased energy. If this job doesn't work out, I will start my own company. So elevated self-esteem or grandiosity. His wife has never observed these symptoms before. The patient has a history of ADHD before, no history of depression psychosis. He drinks two or three beers on weekend. Others are all normal. What is your diagnosis? So what you can find out, the patient is irritable, hyperactive, lack of sleeping, very destructive, and having high self-esteem or grandiosity. So this patient is having ADHD, bipolar one, bipolar two, cyclothymic disorder, schizoaffective disorder, substance induced mood disorder. This patient is specifically having mania at the moment, but you can say that it's a bipolar one disorder because bipolar one disorder can initially come with mania, then maybe followed by few years, patient will be depressed also. But if there is a mania and there is no mania in the option, but there is bipolar one disorder in the option, you can choose that one. Why you cannot choose bipolar two disorder? Because bipolar two disorder needs major depressive disorder or depression with hypomania but this patient never ever had any depression before so it's not a bipolar 2 disorder cyclothymic disorder it should be at least two years of depression and mania like features but this patient doesn't have any depression so cyclothymic is not appropriate and it's it's just for like 10 days time, this is happening. So more than one week. Look at this question. 
27 year old man brought to the office by his wife due to her concern that he is not himself. He says that he is depressed and withdrawn, sleeps 14 hours a day, has no energy or interest in looking for work or participant in any activities. So depression like feature. Patient was hospitalized six months ago for an episode in which he was aggressive, is staying up all night, gambling, investing a large amount of money in starting up an internet company that soon became bankrupt. At that time, patient spoke very rapidly and you already understand that patient had a mania at that time. He also experienced a similar episode two years ago and improved. Which of the following medication are most appropriate for maintenance treatment of this patient? Now this patient is a bipolar patient, right? And you want to add some maintenance treatment for this patient. What do you want to give here? You want to give carbamazepine and fluxetine? Usually we don't give that. You want to give lithium quetiapine, lithium sartaline, loracidone and risperidone, valproate clozapine. Yes, right. That's the question we have just discussed, right? This patient has a mania before, now depressed. So we will give lithium and sartreline because this is a bipolar depression case. Good guys, very good. Everyone all right in the live Facebook group? Are you getting me guys or any, any problem you're facing in the live? If you are having difficulty in the live, you can easily come to the Zoom. Zoom usually is easier and you can, you, you can interact with me very easily. Okay, now let's start with the schizophrenia. If you look at the schizophrenia, it's a vast topic to discuss. We will try to finish this one tonight so that we can discuss other psychiatry related thing in the next session. So schizophrenia means it's a psychosis. Many Many times in the exam, these things can come that prevalence of schizophrenia. You need to memorize this one. So in a general population, it's a 1% chance. In monozygotic twin, it's 47%. Dizygotic twin, 12%. If you have one schizophrenic parent, there is a possibility of 12% schizophrenia in the offspring. Two schizophrenic parent, 40%. One first degree relative, 12%. One second degree relative, 5 to 6%. So if I ask you that a patient comes to you asking about the chance of schizophrenia for him and his grandfather had schizophrenia, what will be your answer? Grandfather. So grandfather is first degree or second degree? Second degree relative. Your first degree relative is your father, mother, your sibling, your siblings or your offspring. Second degree relative is your grandfather, grandmother, aunt. They are usually your aunt or uncle. These are your second degree relative. So grandfather has schizophrenia so for this patient chance is five to six percent
to diagnose schizophrenia there is very important to have at least two or more of the following so among these five at least two should be there to diagnose it as a schizophrenia so delusion which is abnormal belief hallucination which like if you see some things that others don't like you can see that uh, there is cockroach crawling all over the room but no one else can see that that's the visual hallucination you can hear someone is talking to you but no one can see them that is auditory hallucination so your hallucination delusion disorganized speech so if your speech is no one can understand what you are talking that is disorganized speech grossly disorganized behavior like your behavior is a kind of psychotic and abnormal like you are wandering around the street you are running in the street naked these are grossly disorganized behavior some of the negative symptoms like your you don't have any insight or flat affect that is also schizophrenia now mainly the signs and symptoms we divide into two part one is positive symptom one is negative symptom positive symptom is particularly important because if anyone has positive symptoms that's an indication to start antipsychotic medication immediately what are the positive symptoms hallucination delusion thought disorder and disorganized behavior or speech negative is your affect is flat that means you don't feel anything your lack of empathy so flat affect thought poverty lack of motivation social withdrawal that is your negative symptoms important to memorize these positive and negative effects or symptoms sometimes some of the illicit drug like amphetamine hallucinogens marijuana can present as a psychosis also so always before diagnosis of schizophrenia we need to rule out illicit drug abuse first what is the treatment of schizophrenia treatment is always in schizophrenia antipsychotic medication usually there is two types of antipsychotic medication one is first generation second generation so typical antipsychotic atypical antipsychotic initially we will start with second generation antipsychotic because second generation has less side effect especially less extrapyramidal side effect most importantly olanzapine is our first choice then risperidone so any of these two we can choose but if both are there then olanzapine we will choose and then risperidone if no response after taking this initial antipsychotic for 4 to 6 weeks then you can change to another second generation or first generation antipsychotic like haloperidol or you can give other second generation antipsychotic like quetiapine eripiprazole those medication if a patient becomes severely antipsychotic that they are becoming a uh, violent and you need to sedate them what you can give you should give haloperidol im at that time or sometimes olanzapine im can be given also but haloperidol im is usually given if a psychotic patient becomes violent like aggressive agitated and violent at that time you can give im haloperidol now sometimes there is a term called drug resistant schizophrenia if you have tried three antipsychotic medication for a maximum period of time and still patient symptom is not improved then only you can use the fourth antipsychotic drug which is clozapine you can only use clozapine if three antipsychotic drugs has been 
not working remember that because close up in we don't like close up in because it has a high side effect profile but it's the most effective antipsychotic drug but it has also more side effect profile close up in why it's important because close up in can cause cardiotoxicity or especially myocarditis and also it can cause some blood discrasis what is that like usually they can cause like pancytopenia agranulocytosis those sort of things they can do so anyone taking close up in you need to check their cbc also troponin and ecg now if a patient with close up in comes to you with a chest pain what's your diagnosis your diagnosis is myocarditis and what you should do you should obviously check troponin in this patient if a patient has taken close up in and is still failed then the option is giving ect electroconvulsive therapy clear about the treatment of schizophrenia those who are having uh, iftar uh, or ramadan those of you you can guys go to go and this uh, this class will be recorded so you will guys you guys will get it in the group so don't worry on that i'm sorry but we had to continue the class in that time but i'm really sorry for that but you can you guys can go and have your iftar and then you can listen to the recordings i will give the recordings in your group tonight thank you all right so let's move antipsychotic drug has a special side effect which we call eps extra pyramidal side effect what are those very important for the exam one is called acute dystonia acute dystonia is usually the patient after taking antipsychotic they will complain about spasm of their face neck tongue or trunk muscle that means muscle spasm what is the treatment give benzotropin iv or im for what is akathisia akathisia patient will feel really really restless and irritable that they cannot even sit in the chair for few minutes so very much restlessness for akathisia akathisia is a kind of dose related symptom or side effect so if you can reduce the dose that will help so first option is reduce the dose of antipsychotic if you cannot do that or if that doesn't help then you can use either beta blocker or diazepam and lastly benzodiazepine but you can use diazepam or propranolol initially for that another side effect is parkinsonian parkinsonian is like remember parkinsonism disease so after taking antipsychotic drug if a patient develops slowness of their movement rigidity like cogwheel rigidity and they are having this particular parkinsonian kind of gait that's usually the side effect of antipsychotic drug you can lower down the dose or usually we stop the medication if parkinsonian symptom develop what is tardive dyskinesia tardive dyskinesia usually remember this usually occurs after a long term use of antipsychotic drug like after months or years in this case you will have involuntary movement of face mouth tongue and trunk like you you will see that your mouth is moving involuntarily that is tardive dyskinesia usually you should stop the drug immediately at that time you can use another drug called tetrabenazine next one is your neuroleptic malignant syndrome as you remember we discussed this is a very important side effect 
and it can develop any time after a starting antipsychotic drug, even in hours to days. Syndrome is usually there will be high temperature, muscle rigidity, altered consciousness. Treatment, discontinue the medication, make the patient hydrated. If life-threatening, you can use bromocaptin or dantrolin. Why? Because dantrolin usually used if there is a like muscular rigidity is very much problematic, then we use dantrolin. All right. So we, we have got acute dystonia. Acute dystonia is usually muscle spasm. So use benzodiazepine. Akathisia is restlessness. We can reduce the dose or we can use propanolol diazepam. Parkinsonian, stop the drug or you can use alternatively lower down the dose. You can use phenothiazine. You can use benzotropin or benzhexol drugs. Cardiac dyskinesia is an involuntary movement of the face, tongue, mouth. Treatment, stop the medication or you can use tetrabenazine. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome, patient comes to you with a high fever, muscle rigidity, altered consciousness. Stop the drug immediately. You can give IV hydration or if it's like really severe muscular rigidity, then you can use, uh, you can use dantrolin or bromocyptin. Now this chart is very, very important for your exam. It's the side effect of antipsychotic drug, which is very important for the exam. Many, many questions can come from here. Why? Because you need to remember the side effect. I will just let you know that what are the most important side effect. Start with the olanzapine because this one is widely used. Olanzapine is particularly notorious for weight gain that means remember olanzapine, clozapine, this causes metabolic syndrome. That means it will increase your body weight. It will cause dyslipidemia or hypercholesterolemia. It will cause hyperglycemia. And it's also a kind of sedative drug. So olanzapine is mainly, main side effect is weight gain, hyperglycemia, and hypercholesterolemia. Risperidone, it can also cause this dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia, weight gain also it causes, but most important side effect is hyperprolactinemia. So patient with risperidone can present to you with galactorrhea or whitish discharge from the breast. That is the effect of hyperprolactinemia due to risperidone. Next is the quetiapine. Quetiapine also causes dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia, and weight gain. But quetiapine usually doesn't cause any hyperprolactinemia. Next important one is clozapine. You can remember clozapine causes similar side effect like olanzapine, weight gain, dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia. If you look at the AEP puzzle, you see that this drug doesn't cause dyslipidemia, doesn't cause hyperglycemia, doesn't cause any hyperprolactinemia, also doesn't increase body weight. Now your question comes, let me ask you a question. If a patient taking risperidone comes to you with galactoria, what's your next option? What do you want to do? If a patient with risperidone comes with galactoria, your First thing is to stop risperidone. Yep. And then switch to another drug which doesn't cause hyperprolactinemia. What is that? Best option is to switch to aripiprazole. 
if adp puzzle is not in the option then you choose quit appin all right so your option will be if a patient with risperidone comes to you with galactoria stop risperidone switch risperidone to adp puzzle not in the option choose quit appin if a patient taking olanzapine comes to you with a weight gain what's your option to choose what you will do now remember for weight gain due to olanzapine you can ask the patient to follow lifestyle modification but you need to switch this medication to quetiapine quetiapine causes low weight gain it causes weight gain but it causes low weight gain so you can change it to quetiapine also if quetiapine is not in the option you can choose eripripazole eripripazole also doesn't cause any weight gain remember quetiapine causes qt prolongation also gipracidone causes qt prolongation but eripripazole doesn't cause any qt prolongation so you can use any patient taking gipracidone or quetiapine comes to you with qt prolongation change it to eripripazole another option will be like um, let me just think what can come usually these are the important options that you should remember i think so yep now let's do some of the oh the another one which i wanted you to know if you want to switch antipsychotic medication what you should do should we give a washout period between these two or we can use another method remember if you want to switch antipsychotic medication there is a very important method to do that you cannot stop immediately there is a term called crossover period yeah dr abu murtaza very good crossover period this crossover period should be done in a hospital what we do in a crossover period the patient was taking a antipsychotic and now we want to change to another antipsychotic let's say patient was taking olanzapine and we want to change it to risperidone what you will do you will gradually taper or decrease the dose of olanzapine and also gradually increase the dose of risperidone so eventually at one point olanzapine dose will be totally decreased and risperidone dose will be maximized so this is called crossover period in which the drug that you are stopping you are gradually reducing the dose and the drug that you are starting you are gradually increasing the dose so that is called crossover method you don't need a washout period in case of antipsychotic drug switch now let's see this question a 52 year old man with schizophrenia is brought to the emergency department by his group home staff he was started on a new antipsychotic for auditory hallucination a week ago and the dose was gradually increased although mildly irritable at baseline the patient has since become increasingly agitated and the dose escalations do not appear to be calming him 
So this is a schizophrenia patient started on a new antipsychotic for auditory hallucination. And you have gradually increased the dose. But since that, patient become increasingly agitated. A staff report that he has been leaving the group home and walking all day in the neighborhood, which is not typical for him. He also becomes quite aggressive. In the ED, patient is restless but shows no localized abnormal movement. What, which of the following is the most appropriate next step in pharmacotherapy? So what do you want to do in here, this patient? You want to decrease the dose of antipsychotic and give benzotropin. Decrease antipsychotic dose, give diphenhydramine. Decrease antipsychotic, administer lorazepam. Discontinue antipsychotic, administer propanolol. Increase antipsychotic dose and administer lorazepam. What do you think this patient is having? You have started antipsychotic. After increasing the dose, patient is getting increasingly agitated and he is leaving the group home in the morning, walking all day in the neighborhood. In the ED patient restless, attempts to walk around the department and into other patients' room. What do you think the diagnosis? Yeah, crossover period is usually one to two weeks time. What's your diagnosis in this case? Let, let me give you a hint. This is a side effect from the antipsychotic drug. Yes, Dr. Faril, very good. This is called akathisia. Why akathisia? Because patient is restless, as you can see, he's moving around and also in the emergency department, he is not sitting or he's not lying in his bed. He's walking around the department and into the other patient room. See that they will not give you like, like a normal scenario, like patient is restless, cannot even rest in anywhere. They will make a scenario and you have to understand that what's going on. So akathisia, for akathisia, what is your treatment? So you have to decrease the dose and you can give either diazepam or you can give beta blocker. Now, what is the diazepam or lorazepam? Same, right? So you can give lorazepam in here. Usually, now in here you will be confused that what you want to do. Do you want to discontinue the antipsychotic? No, you don't need to discontinue totally. Again, if you want to choose in between lorazepam and propanolol, remember it's a diazepam usually better for making a patient stable, making a patient calm and sedated. So you can choose lorazepam or diazepam first. Even in here, that's why the C and D option, if you see, one option is decrease the dose, another option is totally discontinue. We are not going to discontinue the drug for akathisia. We just need to decrease the dose. So option C will be correct. Let's go to some of the other psychotic disorder. We will finish in like 15 minutes, guys. Okay. Other psychotic disorder, one is brief psychotic disorder. Brief psychotic disorder means like patient is having psychotic symptoms, but the symptoms will never ever is more than one month. So less than four weeks, or less than one month psychotic symptoms, that is brief psychotic disorder. If you see here, a 35 year old female Chinese immigrant brought in by neighbors after she was found wandering in the street. She appears disheveled, grossly disorganized. You learn that she arrived in the US several days ago and upon her arrival, witnessed the death of her three year old son. While in the waiting room, she appears to be responding to internal stimuli. This line is particularly for hallucination. So anyone responding to internal stimuli, that means having some hallucination. So obviously this patient is having psychotic behavior, like wandering in the street. This is disorganized or abnormal behavior. 
and you have also got hallucination. Remember, at least two of the five symptoms, you have got disorganized or abnormal behavior, you have got psychosis, you have, you have got hallucination, sorry. So this is psychotic symptoms, but it's less than one month. Because it's like a few days ago, she, she has arrived here and she has witnessed the death of her three-year-old son. So symptoms more than one day, but less than 30 days, that is your brief psychotic disorder. In this case, also hospitalization is warranted if patient is having acutely psychotic symptoms, like this patient having acute hallucination. Another one is called schizophreniform disorder. What is schizophreniform disorder? Schizophreniform disorder means symptoms of psychosis more than one month, but less than six months. If you look at this question, you can see Mrs. Jones is evaluated at a nearby clinic after she was noticed to be acting inappropriately at work. According to her co-workers, she began acting strangely three months ago. So three, you already got this is a three months problem. At that time, she began wearing a hard hat to work when asked why, replied, I will not let you read my mind. Okay. She also believed that others were talking about her and routinely asked them to stop. What this is? If anyone thinks that others are talking about her, there is a particular name of that condition. This is called delusion of reference. It's a delusion of reference. You have to remember, I will discuss various delusion which can come in the exam sometimes. One of them is delusion of reference, which is if someone thinks that people are talking about the patient or people are talking about her or him, then it's a delusion of reference. So you have got psychosis features, but it's for three months time. So what is the condition? Schizophreniform disorder. And what do you think you have got? You have got disorganized or abnormal behavior. You have got a delusion. So already you have got two. So it's a schizophrenia, schizophreniform disorder or psychosis. The particularly important one is this one, the schizoaffective disorder, which sometimes becomes difficult in the exam to find out. Why? Because in here, schizoaffective disorder, you have both affective problem and psychotic problem. Psychotic problem, you already understand that there will be hallucination, deletion, or abnormal behavior. And affective disorder means either mania or depression will be associated with psychosis. So schizoaffective disorder, if you look at this question, this is a famous question actually. A 25 year old woman found walking nude in the shopping mall. When asked why, she replies, I am making it easy for others to have sex with me since I know they all want me. This is an abnormal belief or delusion. She states she heard a voice telling her she was irresistible. So hallucination. You have got hallucination, delusion, abnormal behavior. When she speaks, she cannot focus on one topic at a time. What is it? This is called flight of ideas. Her mood is euphoric, her affect labile. So this is mania. She recounts an episode last year where although she did not have elevated or depressed mood, she heard voices she could not describe. So she had an episode of psychosis solely. And these symptoms lasted for more than six months. Schizoaffective disorder, there is the criteria will be patient will have psychosis and depression or mania all together. And there will be a history previously that patient had a psychosis 
just psychosis, no depression. So exclusively psychotic history, followed by patient has both psychosis and affective disorder concurrently. That is called schizo affective disorder. Now in here, you can see schizoaffective disorder means uninterrupted period of symptom having major depression or mania or mixed episode and symptoms of deep schizophrenia will be all together. These patients have better prognosis than patient with schizophrenia. Treatment, hospitalization if needed, use antidepressant medication and or, or anticonvulsant to control the mood symptom. If not effective, then consider antipsychotic. Remember this one, very important. In schizoaffective disorder, first you start with antidepressant or anticonvulsant. If not effective, then only antipsychotic. Many candidates get it wrong because as the name is schizoaffective, they think that, all right, first of all, treat antipsychotic. No. The last one is the delusion disorder. Delusional disorder means if a patient has only delusion, no other features of schizophrenia, no hallucination, no abnormal behavior, and patient is like, his life is not interrupted for this abnormal behavior. If you look at this question, you can see Mr. Smith has been married for 10 years. During most of those years, he believed his wife was trying to poison him to get his money. He frequently complains of stomach pain, which he believes is due to the poison in the food. So this is a kind of pargicutory or paranoid delusion. Paranoid delusion is a kind of delusion in which patient thinks someone is trying to harm them or someone is trying to spying on them or even killing them. That is called paranoid delusion or pargicutory delusion. His thoughts are logical and coherent. So there is no abnormal thought which excludes schizophrenia. No hallucination. Again, it's not a schizophrenia. His wife, an independently wealthy woman, does not understand her husband's logic because she has more money than he does. So he's having this abnormal belief only. His thought processes are good. His, he doesn't have any other features of schizophrenia. So that is your delusional disorder. So delusional disorder, if a non-bizarre kind of delusion for at least one month, no impairment in the level of functioning, patients are usually reliable. And usually these things like they, like sometimes there is a question can come like a university professor comes to the dean or counselor of dean or chancellor of the university that he thinks that some alien is trying to attack the earth and he needs to do something to avoid this attack. This patient was very good and he's been getting promotion in the university for the last 10 years, but he has only this belief that alien is coming from the moon to the earth to attack the earth. So what do you think? This is delusional disorder. So patient socially, occupationally, familial, everything is fine, but they just have some abnormal belief. And their belief is not like Bizarre kind of belief means that if you think that you don't have any head, you don't have any body, and you think that your head is full of worms, these are kind of bizarre delusion that is totally impossible. Non-bizarre, non that it is still a little chance that it can happen. Like wife is trying to poison him. There is a chance. It's not totally impossible. So the, the, these are non-bizarre kind of delusion. 
especially Dr. Faril, delusional disorder usually have non-bizarre kind of delusion. But the thing is, even if kind of bizarre delusion, but patient doesn't have any other features of uh, schizophrenia, we don't think it as a diagnosis of schizophrenia. For schizophrenia, you should have at least two things, either hallucination, delusion, abnormal behavior, thought poverty. So any of these, at least two should be there. Only delusion, you cannot diagnose it as schizophrenia. So at that time, your diagnosis will be only delusional disorder. This is a particularly important because it's very hard sometimes in the exam to diagnose, is it a schizophrenia or delusional disorder? Also in this case for delusional disorder, you don't need hospitalization, you can give antipsychotic drug. Let's just practice some of the question which we have discussed today. What do you think this one? A 28 year old woman comes to the office for a follow up visit to monitor her psychiatric medication. Patient says, I am not feeling depressed for the first time in years, but the voices just won't go away. So you have got voice, so hallucination. She hears the voice several times a week, which, she, which say, say that she is stupid and ugly. So it's a kind of auditory hallucination. Two months previously, the patient was hospitalized for increasing auditory hallucination and fear that her boss and co-workers had been replaced by imposter. During that same period, she felt increasingly hopeless, had so little energy that she find it difficult to get out of bed. The patient had lost eight pounds, slept 12 hours a day, preoccupied with feelings of worthlessness and guilt that she was destroying her family. She was treated with fluxetine and eripiprazole and discharged. So what do you think, think what was happening at that time? Since discharge, the patient mood and energy is good. However, during the past month, she has continued to hear voice and remains convinced that her boss is not who he says she is. At the moment, this patient is having only psychotic feature. And also during the other time, just two months ago, this patient had full-blown schizoaffective disorder. So this is the particular kind of situation when we say that it is, this condition is called schizoaffective disorder, where a patient will have exclusive psychotic feature for more than two weeks, which is now the patient is having. And there will be a history of where the patient has both psychosis and affective disorder, which the patient had two months ago. So this is called schizoaffective disorder. Why this is not major depression with psychotic feature? Because this is why I am again and again saying major depression with psychotic feature. The criteria is the psychotic feature will be only present with major depression, never ever exclusively alone. Whereas in schizoaffective disorder, psychotic feature can be present for more than two weeks without any affective disorder. But number C option, psychosis will always be there with depression, never ever alone. Clear everyone? So this one is particularly important. I always want you to understand that because you can, again, use if you want to see that two months previously, patient was hospitalized for auditory hallucination. So having psychosis. During that time, she was having hopelessness, little energy, sleep problem, 
guilty feeling, so also depression. And you can see the treatment was fluxetine and eripiprazole. So that was schizoaffective disorder. And now the patient is having only psychosis without any depression. This is the, that solely or exclusive psychotic feature which can happen with schizoaffective disorder. So your option, correct option is D. So you can see the DSM criteria is major depression or manic episode concurrent with schizophrenia. And there will be a history of deletion or hallucination for more than two weeks in the absence of any major depression or manic episode. Another question, women presents after death of her sister, which is indicative of major depression. This is particularly, you can see, these are the questions which is very similar to AMC exam. Like in the exam, you will find it hard to choose which one you will choose. If you see A, B, C, D, E, all are MSH caps. So effect in food and sleep, poor concentration, weight loss, and hedonia, lack of energy. But you have to choose one. So you have to choose the best one. If you remember, I said there is two symptoms which should be there. One is either lack of interest, which is anhedonia. Another one is low mood. So in all these options, this option is the best option to choose. Let's discuss this one. 44 year old women complains of itchiness in the skull. Upon checking her record, Patient has been seen by dermatologist and noted normal finding. Patient now tells you there are worms in her head and it needs frequent medicated shampoo to get rid of it. She asks for prescription. What is your diagnosis? So you can see patient complains of itchiness and she needs shampoo for that, but dermatologist did not find anything. So is it a schizotypical schizophrenia, delusional disorder, obsessive compulsive, or Munchausen disorder? You don't know Munchausen disorder, we haven't discussed it. It's a factitious disorder in which a person assumes sick role. They usually want to get admitted in the hospital. Now, you can see in this patient, there is no hallucination, there is no abnormal behavior, only there is an abnormal belief that patient is having something in the skull that's causing the itchiness, even though there is nothing seen by the dermatologist. That is an example of abnormal belief. And it's a non-bizarre kind of belief, which diagnosis should be delusional disorder. Clear everyone? I guess that was all about our today's class. Just before we finish, I just want to take a little, um, little amount of time from you guys. Just give me five minutes so that we can discuss about that, how, the, how our course can be beneficial for your exam preparation. Now, remember one thing, it's not a mandatory to have, a, have, have, have to join a course for your passing the exam. But what it can help is that it can decrease your wasting of time. If you prepare by solely, it will take some time. So it's better to take some help and take some help from someone who knows what are the questions that is important for your exam. It's not like that you will just do the theory and when you will do the theory, you will not get any questions related to the theory. So at that time, there is no role of reading that theory. You should always read theory based on the questions that can come in the exam. And that's when you will understand that why I am actually doing these questions. Otherwise, you will feel like whatever I am doing in the theory is not coming in the exam. 
right? So that's important to understand always. Like when you will prepare for your exam, make sure that you get help from someone who knows what to, what to read and how to read. I'll just have, I know that most of you have seen our course details. Just if you guys have any questions about how is our course going on and how everything will be conducted, you can ask it here. Feel free to ask any question. I will be able to answer you here. So you can see in here, our course is, is a five months duration course. And usually it's three days per week. Fixed class is usually Sunday and Friday at 8 to 10.30 p.m. Sydney time. Class will be on Zoom. We also will have one extra class most of the week based on how we progress. In the class, you will get complete theory class. We will discuss some practice test on theory, like after every system, like if we finish psychiatry, we will, you will have the chance to take exam on our software. Like there is unlimited amount of questions. You can prepare yourself and you can see how you are doing with your theory. We have also this sort of subjective sample question practice. So we have like for psychiatry, there are some important questions we will practice that will help you to understand how exam questions come. We will discuss like recently, recent some of the sample question, like especially two years recent sample questions. And also you will have a lot of mock tests on those sample questions. We have a software which is similar to the exam that you will have and you will get unlimited amount of monthly mock test. You will get full 150 question mock test. And also there are smaller subjective mock test, practice question mock test. There is full model test. So a lot of things are there just for your practice. There is a QBank you will get free of charge and which is highly effective and it may cost a lot of amount if you want to buy it by yourself. So it's a totally free of charge. You will get extra classes on these topics, which usually candidate find really difficult. So ECG, imaging, CT scan, CTG, STAT, ethics, driving, fundoscopy. So there is a lot of small topics that we need to always, you need to cover that before going for exam. You will be having the class recordings and the notes in our software. You can you can always have a look and you can always get into the software and you can find it. All the books are online. PDF books you will get from us. So you don't need to buy any books. You can buy the capital, uh, the gem if you want, but it's still, if you are, if you are a person with like computer based or soft uh, or laptop based, if you can read, then that's a very easy. And the course fee is very minimal. If you think about like how our course is running and everything, it's just a 449 Australian dollar. I, we have actually reduced the amount because of the recent COVID situation. I understand that most of you are having some difficulty with the money at the moment. So this is actually the minimum amount that we need to take it because we need to run a software and then also make payments to the software people. So there is some amount that we need for their purpose also. So that is all about us. You can also visit our website. This is a website you can find in our group. So all the update about the course, you can get it in the group first aid AMC MCQ. Any questions you have, you can feel, you can ask me in the email that is provided. And if any one of you wants to join the course, feel free to ask me in the messenger or it will be better if you go through the website or if you go through the email. There will be a next class coming on based on psychiatry questions. I will update it maybe in the next week. 
and the deadline of joining the class will be like we are starting it on 30th may so you can make your payment before 25th of may Uh, Dr. Shaila, like if you are if you are appearing for next September 2020, so you don't have like much time at that time. So it's still like June, July, August, September. So four months you will get from us. That's enough for preparation, because initially usually the most important topics we will finish initially, and just a few things will be left for the last few months. So initial lectures will be important for you. Any question from those who are in the Facebook group? All right, then, then we can finish today's lecture. And thank you so much for joining to this class. And um, let me assure you that we may be new in the online class, but we have the experience of teaching people for more than three or five years. So you can rely on us that we will not be someone that we will stop somewhere or we will not dissatisfy you, that we can say. You will be satisfied after the course. And also there is a thing that we have said that once you are in our course, you will be there forever unless or until you pass the exam. So usually, I don't think if you follow us 100%, you should not fail the exam. But in the unlikely cases, if you do have that sort of unlucky situation, at the time you may continue with us even without any further charge. So that's our commitment that you will continue our course until you pass the exam. Okay, thank you so much for joining today's class. We hope that you guys enjoyed the class. Thanks all, have a good night, bye.